Buddha summarized. Sanjaya said, seeing Arjuna full of compassion, his mind depressed, his, his eyes full of tears, Madhusudan Krishna spoke the following words. The Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, but to infinity. O son of Buddha, do not yield to this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up such petty weakness of heart, and arise, O chastiser of the enemy. Arjuna said, O killer of enemies, O killer of Madhu, how can I counteract with arrows in battle men like Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of my worship? It would be better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though desiring worldly gain, they are superiors. If they are killed, everything we enjoy will be tainted with blood. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. If we kill the sons of the Tarasra, we should not care to live. Yet they are now standing before us on the battlefield. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of my early weakness. In this condition, I am asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I am your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. I can find no means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to dispel it even if I win a prosperous, unrivaled kingdom on earth with sovereignty like the demigods in heaven. Sanjaya said, Having spoken thus, Arjuna, chastiser of enemies, told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. O descending of Bharata, at that time Krishna, smiling, in the midst of all the armies, spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. The Supreme Personality of God had said, While speaking learning words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise have meant neither for the living nor for the dead. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body, from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. O son of Kundi, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress, and their disappearance in due course, are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O sign of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress, and is steady in love, is certainly eligible for liberation. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of love. That which pervades the entire body you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight, O descendant of Bharata. Neither he who thinks the living entity the slayer, nor he who thinks it slain, is in knowledge. For the self slays not, nor is slain. For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. O oh, Bhartha, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble, and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable, and immutable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. If, however, you think that the soul, or the symptoms of life, is always born and dies forever, 
we still have no reason to lament, Almighty Allah. One who has taken his birth is sure to die, and after that, one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? Some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. O descendant of Bharata, he who dwells in the body can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any living being. Considering your specific duty as a Chatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles, and so there is no need for hesitation. O oh, Partha, happy are the Chatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come on side, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. If, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. People will always speak of your infamy, and for a respectable person, dishonor is worse than death. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only, and thus they will consider you insignificant. Your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? 